Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Pain Reduction Methods for Vascular Access. I'm Judy Thompson, the Director of Education at the Association for Vascular Access. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Amy Baxter. Amy is a graduate of Yale and Emory Medical School. She is a double-boarded pediatric emergency physician and CEO of Pain Care Labs, invented Buzzy, for shots, Vibracool cryotherapy, distraction cards, and other drug-free pain relievers. As a pediatric emergency physician, her mission is to uncouple pain from fear and give people power over pain. Federally funded, she publishes and lectures nationally and internationally on pain relief. She created the BARF Pediatric Nausea Scale, spoke at TED Med, Exponential Medicine, and was a 2017 healthcare transformer, named the idea person by the Wall Street Journal, and was the 2014 innovative CEO of Georgia Bio. She also turned down an investment on the Shark Tank. With that, and much, much more about this woman, now please sit back and enjoy the next hour. Thank you very much. I'm going to get this show started. I'm also known for being the person who takes out the garbage in my company every Friday. So lots of extra accolades that uh, you could have mentioned, but definitely uh, garbage taker is the one that matters the most here over the weekends. Um, I think you've all seen enough or, or heard enough about what I've done. And I will say that I practice pediatric emergency medicine for 20 years. And so most of my research during that time was on needle fear, needle phobia, pain management, procedural sedation. And I also, if any of you are in institutions that measure children's nausea, uh, I think on my tombstone is gonna be my BARF scale, my Baxter Animated Retching Faces Nausea Scale, which is currently validated in about three languages. So um, I've clearly had a lot of the squirrel distractions in my peripatetic career. But today, what I'm very excited about is to talk about everything that I've learned in 20 years about pain management for vascular access, for vasovagal syncope, and where the field is going. And in addition, it's really great to have the opportunity to give best practices on thermomechanical pain management, which is the device that I invented about 2004 um, that I will sometimes slip and call buzzy. So on my faculty disclosure information, I will say that in the past 12 months, I've had a significant financial interest with the company of Pain Care Labs, and I am the inventor of buzzyhelps.com, distraction cards, and the Vibracool Vibrating Cryotherapy. And the other thing that I need to disclose is that I will be talking about an unapproved and investigative use of a commercial project. You are probably all very well acquainted with Elemax uh, liposomal lidocaine for topical anesthetic. Believe it or not, it is not FDA registered for needle procedures. So I'm going to talk about it. There's lots of data, but it just doesn't happen to have an FDA indication for that. And any photographs are public domain or are provided by families with their permission. So with all of that stuff put behind us, let's talk about the state of the art with patients in needle fear and what the new standards for pain relief are. My learning objectives for you, and I would like you to know about everything from topical anesthetics, cognitive interventions, and thermomechanical pain relief options that you have to put for any individual patient that comes to you, whether pediatric or adult. And after you participate in this activity, if I have done my job, you will be able to explain how needle fear is generated, the relationship between vasovagal syncope and needle fear, and the places where there is a lack thereof. And you'll be able to discuss with colleagues an approach to evaluating and making a plan for any age patient with needle fear. And as I like to say, you'll know more than anyone on the floor for using thermomechanical pain relief for needle pain. So as a uh, very, um, whoops, as a very peripatetic, uh, physician looking into different kinds of research, I think I was driven by a desire to be a know-it-all. So I'd like to share that joy of know-it-allness with you. And part of what we're going to talk about with the cause and consequences of needle fear 
is the trajectory and what the recent research is. We'll switch then to vasovagal sym symptoms and talk about the prevalence and the approach to addressing a patient who has issues with syncope. This will lead us to discussing the pain fear focus model of pain relief. I think this is probably one next to the BARF scale, uh, one of the contributions scientifically I'm most proud of because it really incorporates how the brain works and is very practical to reduce to practice for your patients some element of dealing with pain and their fear and focus for an optimal result with every needle procedure. And then finally, uh, the, the science that underlies why thermomechanical pain relief works is only recently being demonstrated. We figured out how to do this and what frequency worked, but the reasons why it works from a physiologic standpoint have only been published in the last five years, and it is actually somewhat complicated. So I'm gonna to try to make it as simple as possible so that you feel comfortable using any part of a thermal or a mechanical stimulator to block pain. All right, so rock and roll. This is the, the saddest part about doing a webinar, is that when I show this slide in live audiences, pretty much half to two thirds of the people laugh, and I call this my empathy check. We as healthcare providers are used to seeing things that cause so much more pain than needles that we've really gotten used to it and we don't have so much empathy. What we do have empathy for is some of the problems that needles can cause. So I'm going to try to make the case that it's worth having empathy for pain even when it's not causing somebody to pass out. One of the reasons is because if you've noticed, if you've been in practice for 20 years, 30 years, don't need to have any hands longer, you have probably seen an increase in the amount of people who come to you with needle fear. And this isn't just a perception, this is actually reality. One of the studies that I did with Renata Engler, who's an allergist and immunologist, is we went back through every paper we could find that gave an incidence of needle fear. And we looked not at the people's ages, but at what year they were born because it turns out needle fear is much more highly correlated with when you were born than it is with how old you are. So the reason for that comes down to the reason of why people become afraid of needles, and it has to do with untreated pain. Today, because of the rise in needle phobia, needle procedures carry more health consequences. One thing that was discovered by Anna Taddeo in her amazing paper in Vaccine in 2012 was that when she surveyed a thousand people and found that 24% of adults were afraid of needles, 63% of kids are afraid of needles, the critical part for our public health system is that of those adults who were afraid of needles, 8% of them, almost 10%, said that they were not planning to vaccinate their children because they were afraid of needles. I did a talk for the Immunoglobulin Society last week and found that of kids with severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, one in five of them change their treatment to something less effective because they're afraid of needles. Flu shots are gonna be a huge issue with COVID this year. And of people, of adults who don't get needles, uh, who don't get flu shots, a quarter of them is because they're afraid of the needle. And finally, one thing that even though we are used to needles and we push through it, Turns out that physiologically, 94% of insulin users who have to give themselves shots every day still have physiologic fear responses to needles. So it makes a lot of sense that the needle is the issue. Turns out for children that needle phobia tends to develop about age four to five and years, and it can be classically conditioned. And what that means is one really bad experience can be enough. James Hamilton published the seminal work on needle phobia in 1995 in the journal Family Practice. And when he asked people who were afraid of needles as adults, if they remember what happened or why they became afraid, almost all of them remembered something that happened between the ages of four and six. So, you know, in some ways you're like, why are people afraid of needles? Um, well, duh, because needles hurt. But the real thing I think is a lot of us feel like we toughed it out 
And so the children who were born, who are younger than us, the people who are afraid of needles are actually just wimpy. Turns out there's a huge difference in what the experience is if you were born before 1983 versus being born after. I was born in 1969. I would have had at most six injections before I was six, uh, before I was two years old. And except for one shot for penicillin in the butt for having strep, I didn't get any more needles until I was an adult. So this is what we found. It correlates most strongly with why people today are more afraid of needles. The reason is because starting in 1982, we began giving booster shots. And what age do you get boosters? Four to six years old. So the correlation between how many scheduled vaccines there are in your birth year and how afraid of needles you are by birth year was 0.87, very highly correlated. And this is what the modern vaccine schedule looks like. And the issue is not at all how many vaccines we're giving. The issue really is those four to six year booster shots. And the reason we know that is because when I was first studying Buzzy, we got an NIH grant and we found that 63% of our teenagers were afraid of needles. They were in the highest quartile of fear, that red bar there. And that wasn't supposed to be. I mean, according to Hamilton, he said only in 1995, only 25% of the kids were afraid of needles. So we looked back at our data to try to figure out what caused some of these kids to be so afraid of needles. And what we found, to be blunt, was that the infant vaccines that had gone from six to 25, that didn't matter. You could stick them like a pincushion. And before age two, they don't remember, so they don't get needle phobia. However, what caused the needle phobia was how many injections they got on the same day in that four to six year period. They're old enough to remember, but they're too young to abstract, so they don't know why something, why they're being held down and poked. So this is a really interesting thing though. If, if those kids, every time they went to the doctor, they got one stick, none of those kids were afraid of needles um, in the highest quartile five years later. So when we looked at them as their, for their adolescent shots, their teenage shots, and looked back at what had happened, the kids whose moms made them get a shot every single time they came to the doctor were not afraid. They had built resilience. If they got two injections and no more, so like several times they'd go to the doctor and get two shots, only 9% of them were afraid of needles in the, that highest quartile. If they got three injections on the same day, then 26% of them were afraid of needles. And the kicker was that if they got between four and five injections on the same day, for those boosters, 50% of them were afraid of needles. Now, to be clear, this is five years later, and we went on to follow up with them and found that if you were in the highest quartile of fear, two and a half times less likely to start their HPV vaccines. So this goes to show that over that three-year time period between age four and six, you can give booster shots anytime in that period and you're within the CDC schedule. But if you cluster them all on one day, then it causes trauma that really does impact people's willingness to get other preventative vaccines down the road. All right, so knowing that we have a dramatically increased amount of fear, how come we don't have a whole bunch more vasovagal? Well, it turns out that fear does not necessarily equal fainting. Um, this person here is like, oh yeah, I just wanted to see if I could handle it. That's not the phrase of somebody who's afraid. It's a phrase of somebody who has a physiologic response to having a needle put in. So it turns out that the incidence of true full on going flat is about one in a thousand to three in a thousand. So it's fairly low. One of the hypotheses is that this is a very strongly genetic uh, conserved thing. If your mother was a fainter, you're more likely to be a fainter. And so to make your patients feel better, one of the, the hypotheses is that the warriors back in the days that we were battling like Braveheart, if you got hit in an artery and you passed out, your blood pressure drops, the bleeding slows down, and you may survive to go procreate with the warrior who does not faint with needles or with arrows or with swords, who then uh, spurts out like the Black Knight in Monty Python and then uh, does not live to go procreate. 
So that's an idea about why the, the likelihood of fainting persists. It's a warrior gene. You're not a wimp, you're actually the descendant of warriors. So there is some correlation between the feelings of lightheadedness and dizziness and the parts that go along with this vasovagal syncope. So it turns out that of people that have symptoms, um, and it's called the, the, the BDRI, Chris France in Ohio has done a lot of research on this, but it's the blood draw reaction inventory. And it's just four things. Do you feel lightheaded? Do you feel weak? Do you feel nauseous? Do you pass out? And so if you're fearful, um, more of those people uh, who had positive responses were fearful than people who weren't. So if you have a lightheaded response, there is a correlation with anxiety in there. Um, but it also happens 20% of the time you can have those lightheaded, nauseous, weak, fainting feelings and not be afraid. So what impacts vasovagal syncope and really going out? How can we uh, keep people from passing out? Because ain't nobody got time for that. So um, age has some impact. Younger people are a little more likely to faint. Low weight, low blood pressure, and all of this is also related to gender. Now, when I ask people, which um, gender do you think, which sex is more likely to pass out? Almost everybody says, oh, it's those big guys. Uh, the reality is it's more likely females. I think we remember when, you know, if you've got somebody big who passes out, everybody's got a story. I remember being back in the 50s pod in my emergency department and this giant lumberjack of a man comes out of his daughter's room where she has just gotten an IV placed and he passes out hard in front of me, he hits his head on the, um, the sink that's in the hall, he starts bleeding, he's obstructing, he's attended, <laughs> he ended up getting transferred to the big people hospital. But that's the story I remember. And so I too am like, oh, maybe it's the dudes, but it's not. It also turns out it's not this concept of, um, oh, the needle made him faint, you know, why, how can you be afraid of needles if you have tattoos? So the, the vagus nerve that is part of the vasovagal syncope that we talked about. So vaso obviously is the blood vessels in the legs, lose their tone, your gravity works and all the blood rushes down into your legs, taking it away from your head, which is what keeps you conscious. The thing that causes the veins to lose tone is the vagus nerve. And vagus comes from the Latin word um, uh, vagabond, same root, it travels everywhere. So if you look at this vagus nerve, which is in yellow, you can see that it travels along everywhere. And the thing that's important for us is on the veins, this vagus nerve is wrapping around the outside. So some people will associate the, the vagal response, the lower blood pressure, dilating the veins, everything dropping out. Some people get uh, so triggered that they can have that happen even when they see a needle or when they, um, one of my employees actually has it happen when she hears the word moist or abscess. So you can have very strong vagal reactions, but for many people, it ha the needle actually has to penetrate the vein to stimulate this drop in blood pressure that causes the vasovagal response. All right, so um, low weight, low blood pressure, gender. So in looking at the incidence of the BDRI symptoms in France's studies with over 3,000 people with multiple studies, 1.5% um, of males would have these symptoms and 3.7% of females. There is uh, some correlation with fear and how long it takes. And so this, if you've got somebody who is afraid of needles, that's the one you want to make it go quickly because if they are more afraid, the longer it takes, the more likely they are to get BDRI symptoms, nausea, lightheadedness, weakness. And if they're not fearful, then a, a very small percentage go. So there is, you know, there's two parts to this. Are you fearful and how long does it take? So France took all of the data from multiple, multiple different studies looking at primarily blood donation and a lot of it was in high school students. Do not be concerned about the complexity of this diagram. I just love this because it sort of shows how it's all related. You can't just address one aspect of pain or fear because everything kind of feeds together. So talking about visa bagel, we're looking at this BDRI down here. 
So again, blood draw, reaction, inventory, lightheaded, nausea, weak, and fainting. So what things cause people to have those symptoms? Well, anxiety is actually the most strongly correlated. That little 3.3, that little 0.336 means that for every person who says they're anxious, they're gonna have an additional third more likely to feel needle pain for that needle, for to say the needle hurts, uh, rather than people are like, yeah, it didn't bother me. Now, if you have needle pain, that also is positively associated with BDRI. So this little path kind of shows you that if you can address anxiety and address pain, you've got two different ways to decrease their likelihood of feeling nauseous and passing out. There are a couple other specific things that have been studied. Uh, if you can increase their blood pressure by having them hold onto their hands, and I'm gonna see if I can, um, all right. So this is, this is an increasing preload maneuver. If you have people um, pull their arms together, what that does is it increases preload up into the heart, which is then gonna increase it up to the carotids in the brain. So this maneuver has been found to improve blood pressure when you're getting a blood draw. So that's one option. That's called applied tension. Distraction doesn't help. Um, taking deep breaths, eh, I mean, a, a good deep breath may actually increase your preload also. Um, some studies have looked at uh, caffeine, and so there is a potential, if you've got someone who passes out so hard they seize, then caffeine and 16 ounces of water are not bad ideas. But, um, the very, very most serious people have tried fluoxetine, which is uh, one of the SSRIs, and it helped a little. So bottom line from this slide is, yeah, there's things you can do uh, physiologically to raise the blood pressure and decrease their likelihood of vasovagal syncope, but they're all a little bit complicated and they don't have great data behind them. You don't have control over their, their sex, their gender, their genetics, their weight. Uh, you can control the blood pressure a little, like we talked about. But the biggest thing that France contributed, I think, ironically, was that asking someone, how afraid are you of having blood drawn out of your arm, lowered the risk of them having a reaction. I think that we are taught not to talk about it because we don't want to either jinx the blood draw or we don't want to bring up an uncomfortable subject. But in his study, while it didn't reach statistical significance, the people who were asked, how afraid are you, were less likely to have symptoms. So the algorithm that is appropriate if you're meeting someone for the first time is how afraid are you of having blood drawn out of your arm? And regardless of whether you're doing a port access or a pick line, it's still a good question because it has been validated. So if they have any positive response at all, tell them that it's reasonable, validate their experience, and then get the history. So if they say, well, nobody likes needles, or well, sure, uh, who doesn't hate them? Then say, oh, you're so right. So many of our patients don't like needles. Did you have anything specific in your history that made you afraid of blood draws? And if they tell you a history, you say, ah, well, this is gonna be completely different. Uh, this reminds me of when I was in emergency departments and doing spinal taps on kids for septic, work, uh, septic workups. So I would tell the mother and father, we're gonna have to do a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap on your child. Did you have an epidural? And if they said yes, I said, well, how was it? And if they said, yeah, it's fine, I'll, then I'll say, well, this is going to be exactly like that. Uh, we're going to take some fluid out, and it's going to be below where the nerves are, and it'll be fine. If they said that their epidural was terrible, horrible, worst experience, then I say, ah, well, this is going to be totally different. We're going to go below where the nerves are. We're just going to take some fluid out, not put anything in. So this is the same kind of approach. When you ask them what their history is, you can tell them, ah. I understand. Well, this will be very different. So it turns out that the brain is an extraordinarily complicated system to determine how safe you are. And pain is really your brain's opinion of how safe you are. So it's not just the physical thing that's happening on the nerves. It's also how afraid of that you are and how much you're paying attention to it. Great example. If you're doing virtual reality, you can handle tubbing for burns 
significantly better than if you do not have any kind of a distraction that's very intense. If you can decrease fear and focus, the pain perception goes down. All of these aspects come together to provide the memory. And it turns out it takes about three good memories to overcome the effects of one previous bad experience. So let's start out by looking at the elements of fear. What can you do to help your patients with fear? Fear not only comes from history, but it also comes from the unknown and the unexpected. I do not like swimming in lakes because I watched Jaws when I was too young and I don't know what's under. I can't see and so I'm afraid of what I don't know and that something unexpected is gonna touch me. Lack of control is another way that humans feel fear. If you feel vulnerable, if you don't feel like you can uh, control what's going on, that's an element of fear that we can help patients with. One of the biggest aspects, particularly for children, is the language that is used strongly influences fear. So one of the biggest ironies is that um, if you want to promote the child coping, you don't want to use reassurance. So what promotes coping behaviors? So coping behaviors are sitting still, listening, not jerking away, and not screaming or asking to go to the bathroom. So humor helps, non-procedural talk, like tell me about your dog, Turns out children actually do very well with commands to use coping strategies. If you see that a child's nervous, you can say, you look like you might be anxious. If you feel nervous, hold up two fingers. And if you feel really nervous, hold up three. This task can be difficult enough that it distracts them from the fear. But the nice thing is that if they start to act fearful, you can command them to say, hey, Timmy, what did we say to do if you're feeling nervous? Are you feeling nervous? And they're gonna remember they're supposed to hold up fingers and that'll buy you a little time to get done what you need. The other thing that, co that promotes coping is giving real choices. Real choices are what Band-Aid do you want? What flavor popsicle do you want when we're done? Avoid false choices. False choices are, are you ready for your x-ray now? Are you ready for your pick line now? Of course they're not ready. That's not really a choice. They can't say, no, actually next week seems good to me. Uh, so you wanna give real choices to promote coping. Undermining coping is empathy. Um, I'm so sorry, it's okay. It's almost over. Um, anything with that kind of voice, the child knows that an adult should not be pandering. And something has gone seriously wrong if the, if the adult is apologizing. Criticism also doesn't help. Um, and giving the child control does not help. I think everyone who's been doing this more than five years knows better than to fall for the urination boy. I gotta go to the bathroom right now. No, you don't. You can wait, it's gonna be two minutes, then you can go. Never give control over going to the bathroom before a fast procedure. Um, and uh, the other hard thing is when they say, is it gonna hurt? You really want to avoid dishonesty. Now, uh, avoiding dishonesty does not mean being bluntly honest, but the best way to avoid being dishonest is to use words that are softer. So things like, well, a lot of kids aren't that bothered by this. Some might find it a little uncomfortable, but it can feel like a strong squeeze. Why don't you tell me afterwards if you thought it was comfortable and if there were things you did that made it feel better? That is a way to answer the question without using words like hurt, poke, sting. You don't want to say, this is going to feel, well, you'll feel a little bit of a sting and a burn. Um, children who are not yet able to abstract are going to think about the last thing that caused them to feel a burn or a sting. And even people who are older that have the um, understanding of a pinch and a burn, still those words cause fear to ramp up, which causes an increased pain perception. One thing with uh, younger children or with people on the spectrum or very anxious adults is to do something called medical reinterpretation. If you see them looking around the room anxiously, 
then say, oh yeah, we've got a lot of equipment. That one there looks a lot like an elephant, doesn't it? It actually does uh, suck up some of the fluids from some procedures, just like an elephant does with its trunk, but we're not gonna use that here today. Looking at a, uh, a an infusion thing, you can say, oh yeah, that looks like uh, one of those silly snakes with the water that would come around, but that's why it goes into the little box so that it doesn't scoot around and it moves really slowly. So reinterpret what they're seeing or what they have questions about. Now, sometimes medical reinterpretation is, you've got too much to reinterpret. So just ask them what they might like to see. Oh, that, that's a very large stretchy band-aid. Uh, that, that is sort of like a push-up or sort of like a, um, sort of like a, an icing that gives it so that things come out in a controlled, very slow manner. One other way for children to decrease fear is to make them feel secured by using parents' position of comfort. So in this situation, the word secure is a pun. You're going to secure their arm and secure their torso. Ideally, you want to secure one joint above where the access is going to be. What I would, this picture, I would much prefer that the gurney be elevated and dad's arm be on top of the child's arm and that the child's arm is at a 90 degree angle. Two reasons, one, because then he's going to secure that uh, joint above, but the other reason is because um, she's bending over too much and that's gotta be bad for her back. So um, the recommendation, the question was, what do you recommend to replace the pinch and burn? So um, tight squeeze, pressure, uh, even the word tweak can be better than pinch. So you're gonna feel a tweak and then there's gonna be a feeling almost like a, a tight squeeze, like one of those Indian sunburns that maybe you got as a kid. Even though it is, you're still using sunburn, you're giving an image of something that was playful and not something that's dangerous. So a lot of studies have looked at tight squeeze and pressure as words that are good substitutes. So this is a good picture of someone who is in a position of comfort. So the child is in the parent's lap. The parent's left arm can be moved upwards to hold her shoulder if she starts moving. So she can have the, the child can be even more secure and pressed against the mom's chest. And this is also providing an opportunity for the child to look at something distracting. Now, this is an interesting um, piece before we move into the pain aspect of pain fear focus. So they did a study with 500 children looking at whether or not blocking their view of the, the uh, phlebotomy was helpful. What they found was that 20% of the children wanted to watch the needle going in and the other 80% did not. The interesting thing was that of those 80%, all of them at some point watched the procedure. So giving the child a choice of, we've got a game for you to play, would you rather it be here so you can also see what I'm doing or would you like to look away? That is a perfectly good real choice to give. And the, the interesting thing is, you know, this guy right here is holding his kid's head so he can't look. I also wouldn't do that. I would have him put his head on the child's shoulder because he can move his neck all around and not change the, the security of the arm that's stabilized to get the blood draw. But by holding his head, he's gonna make him more anxious because the kid can't see what's going on on the other side. So this is great because this child has the opportunity to look and watch the blood draw if she wants, but if she doesn't, she can look at the cards. This is a study that was done in a group in uh, New Zealand where they had non-adherent patients who had rheumatic fever. So they had to get a bicillin injection once a month and these patients were not showing up to clinic because they didn't like getting a bicillin injection. And what they found was um, by using a thermomechanical device to decrease the injection pain 
and giving them a choice of lidocaine that after three different experiences, after three months, the pain and the fear dropped by half. So this just um, goes to show that by decreasing fear, you're not gonna get an immediate response every time. You have to reprogram them. After six months of this clinic, the pain and fear and non-adherence had dropped to such a point that they were able to get rid of this special clinic and just mix these patients back in with the regular ones because they were able to tolerate it. All right, so you got fear on lockdown. Now let's talk about how pain figures in and what you can do about pain management. To address IV pain, you've got a couple of different categories of options. One is to use different equipment. All of the studies that evaluate different equipment, first of all, as a rule, are funded by the companies who make the equipment. The other thing is that the people they recruit for these studies are adults who are not afraid of needles. So that means that these adults can be very dispassionate and observational about trying to rate how much pain a five bevel needle has compared to a coated needle compared to a normal butterfly. This means it's not necessarily applicable to the patient who is afraid of needles. For example, children have not ever shown a difference in needle equipment in terms of studies looking at how they respond, whether it be for diabetes, insulin injection, it's, it's only the adults who don't mind needles where you see a difference. So this is really not a place that you wanna change your practice or your behavior if you wanna help the patients who've got needle phobia or vasovagal syncope. Technique definitely can make a difference. So people who are able to really have a, a gut instinct for the angle of the vein, how to put it in, where to put it, definitely there can be some reduction. But again, for patients who are afraid of needles, whether or not your technique is fantastic or not may not help that much. I think we've all seen children who are screaming bloody murder when you start to put an alcohol swab and clean and prep an area, even though nothing has been painful in the least yet. And that is the effect that fear can have on ramping up the perception of pain. So technique is great for the patients who are not afraid of needles, doesn't necessarily help so much when someone's got a significant amount of fear. What does help is distraction and altering the sensations of the nerve. We call this neuromodulation. So just a fancy word for modulating or changing the way the nerves behave. And this can actually reduce pain up to 90%. So getting down into the nitty gritty of how neuromodulation works, let's talk about how pain is processed. So there are very small spidery A delta nerves that are a web of pain perception that are at the very surface of the skin all over. They are transmitted very quickly. And there are some A delta nerves that are lowered down. There are some that are in veins themselves, but primarily these are gonna be on the surface. And when they transmit to the back part of the spinal cord, they're modified about 95% of the neurons in the spine don't go to the brain. They just modify the inputs that come in and then they'll go up to the brain. Now, one thing to look at on this little A delta nerve, it's very fast and it looks like little hot dogs end to end. What's happening is that there is fat that covers up the nerve, except for, it's called myelin, but except for at these little places where the hot dogs meet. And at that point, sodium comes out and then triggers the next little hot dog junction, the next junction, the next junction. So things that can block sodium from coming out, like lidocaine, Emla, LMX, anything that's got a cane at the end of it, there's sodium channel blocking. So what they're doing is they're stopping the proliferation of that signal bouncing from hot dog end to hot dog end. C fibers, um, the orange one that's right underneath, they don't have myelin, which means that it's a much slower transmission. There's no way to scoot it up as quickly to the spinal cord, but over time it's gonna build. So a good example of that is pressure that builds over time or cold. If you put your hand in a bucket of ice water looking for one, the last Diet Coke, let's say, 
and you start digging around, you sense that it's cold, but it's not unpleasant until you've had your hand in there for a couple of minutes. And then you're like, okay, this is, I don't like this. I'm just going to take whatever beverage I can. I give up. So the reason it takes so long for that, that um, perception of discomfort to arise is because that cold is transmitted on a C fiber. So it has to build up over time. We'll talk a little bit more about what C fibers do in the brain and cold transmission, but the, the real place we want to work with neuromodulation is with these A beta fibers. So the A beta fibers are much bigger than the A delta, much faster, and they transmit a lot more information. So if you, for example, bump your elbow and you rub it, the pain of the bump is completely overwhelmed by the sensation of rubbing. And the reason is because what you're doing with that rubbing is you are pressuring four different mechanoreceptors that will then send a signal that gets to the back of the spine first and it can override pain. So what we do with the thermal mechanical cold and vibration is manipulate the C fibers and the A beta fibers so that we can block out the sharp A delta fiber. So I'm not gonna go too much into this slide right now. I just wanna show you the four different receptors that can go to the spine on these A beta fibers and can block pain. And you may have heard of this uh, called gate control. So gate control is, when Melzack and Wall came up with it in 1965, they were like, what we're doing is we're shutting the gate on fast pain. Um, and that's, that's pretty accurate. But what really is happening is that the signal from these four mechanoreceptors, the Messner, the Pacinian, the Ruffini, and the Merkel discs, those signals get to the spine faster. And unless the pain is severe, these signals go to the brain preferentially. It turns out the one that makes the most difference for pain is the Pacinian corpuscle. It does about 80% of pain blocking. It is the one that does uh, position sense. It's the receptor for moving your arm. So it's clustered around joints. And the other new piece of knowledge in the last couple of years is that to trigger the Pacinian maximally, you need to have a frequency of about 180 to 250 Hertz. And if you're slower than that, like a lot of TENS units, you're not going to effectively block pain. You really need to have this frequency be much faster. And that's where the vibratory frequency of the thermomechanical device we're talking about is in. It's about 200 hertz. So it's right in that sweet spot to maximally block pain. Dr. Baxter, we're using a TENS unit. Which of these A beta, A delta fibers does the TENS unit affect? Sure. So, so there are two different places that it tends hits. Um, the ones that are fairly slow, like between two and five hertz, those are going to get the Messner corpuscles. And so they're um, the same. So Icy Hot or Tiger Balm or Menthol or Camphor, any of those that cause little tingly sensations, those are blocking pain with the Messner corpuscles. And it's a much slower um you can either do it with slow electricity with a TENS unit, or you can do it with Tiger Mom or whatever. Um, for the deeper ones, the TENS units are trying to twitch the muscles to trigger the corpuscle, the Pacinian corpuscle. And again, this is the, this um, Pacinian corpuscle thing, that was only published in 2017. So all of this, you know, we've been using this 200 hertz frequency because it was the one that worked, but just through experimentation and trial and error, and so we've been at about 200 hertz this whole time, come to find out that the reason that TENS units have such erratic um, behavior is that if you want, if you, because you've got to, to trigger the Pacinian to do most of the pain relief, and because the frequency is 180 to 250, a lot of those TENS units are either too slow or in order to get down deep enough to trigger them, you've got to have a really jacked up amplitude of electricity, which a lot of people can't tolerate. So it works in the clinical studies because the clinical trials get rid of all the people who can't tolerate it. And so everybody in those trials can tolerate having enough electricity to get down to twitch the muscles to twitch the nerves. But the reason that VibraCool works better than TENS is because it's a mechanical stimulus that immediately triggers the Pacinian corpuscle without having to go through the intermediary of twitching the muscle to twitch the nerve. 
So looking at the different options you have from a time standpoint to block pain, MLA requires at least 60 minutes, LMAX requires uh, between 20 and 40. One study at CHOP found it was 40 minutes to get to uh, IV access compared to a thermal mechanical option for three minutes. Sonera is a nice choice. It's expensive. Um, they're about 20 bucks each, but it is a hot pack with a 7% tetracaine and lidocaine in it. So the bad part is you can't have children chewing it because it's toxic. But the good part is the heat pack will vasodilate. So you'll get additional, um, additional ease of cannulation. Cold spray is fast, but it also has been found in a meta-analysis to actually cause as many problems on the whole as it solves. It shouldn't be used in children. And in adults, there's no data that it's any better than, um, that it's, and it's any better than uh, placebo. Now, the, the question is, do they constrict the veins? So we're gonna talk about EMLA in just a second about constriction. There was one study early on that compared the vibration and cold versus cold spray and found that the buzzy unit was three times more likely to get a stick, first stick, than cold spray. One of the problems is that cold spray does vasoconstrict. It, when it has to be applied directly to the vein, it's going to vasoconstrict. Buzzy is proximal, so you don't ever put ice directly on the site. But um, yes, cold spray will vasoconstrict. And I'm gonna answer the uh, other question about MLA vasoconstricting in a second, because it's really interesting. So the cost comparison is mostly because most of these items have to be used per patient. Very few that are reusable. MLA getting to the vasoconstriction. So the fascinating thing is that MLA does vasoconstrict when it's left on less than an hour. Now, if you're gonna be doing a pick line and you've got three hours until you need to go get the person, the nice thing about EMLA is that it will continue to increase in potency up to four hours when you have to remove it, and it will stay numb for an extra two hours. So that's a great option for lumbar punctures, for pick lines when you have time. It does need to be left on longer for darker skin patients because the connections between the stratum corneum are tighter. And so one study actually looked at taking a piece of tape and ripping off the outer uh, layer of skin to make it work faster. But that um, really just shows that, that when you see studies where EMLA or LMAX don't work as well in African Americans, it's because it doesn't penetrate as easily and takes longer. So when we were at, um, I was at UT Southwestern, and we would often have a four-hour wait in our emergency room, we put Imla on when they were in triage. And what we found was that the success of first stick cannulation varied dramatically by time. That less than one hour um, was actually using something called intention to treat, which means if they had Imla on, even if the nurse went for a different vein, we still counted it. But if you looked at the success rate for poking where the EMLA was placed, if it's on less than an hour, the success rate was 26%. And this is in a very seasoned, experienced group of people. So there are two studies that show that EMLA does not decrease success when it's left on for an hour or longer. We found that if it's left on for two hours, it actually increased success up to 92%. But the takeaway here is if you're not sure you're going to have time, EMLA is not a good choice. One interesting thing about LMAX, so LMAX is a liposomal formulation of a sodium channel blocker, lidocaine. It goes into the skin quickly, but it also diffuses away. The interesting thing about this in children is that keeping it in place with Tegaderm actually caused more pain for some of these kids. So if you've got, uh, if you're in a hemonc ward or a place with glad press and seal, you're gonna prep and clean the area anyway, but press and seal will hold on to skin so you can hold it in place with that and it does not cause pain when you take it away. And by IV success, I mean, no, IV success is that they were able to cannulate in one stick. So when I say it increased IV success, it meant purely that um, first stick in they got 
labs and or successful cannulation or we're able to place the IV. All right. Um, so JTIP is a, about $6 a pop, and the pop is a critical part about this. It is using compressed carbon dioxide to shove lidocaine under the skin. It is loud, but it doesn't hurt to have it go in the skin. The contraindication is you cannot use it for someone who's on blood thinners or is a hemoc patient because it will cause bleeding and tattoo the skin. Uh, so what is Buzzy? So Buzzy is a high frequency vibration unit with optional ice that can be put underneath it. And there are at this point over 50 randomized controlled trials. The average pain reduction uh, depends on whether you're an adult or a child. It's between 50 and 80%. And Children's Healthcare of Philadelphia found that Buzzy gave equivalent pain relief for IV access in the emergency department as LMAX, but in three minutes instead of 40. 81% uh, of phlebotomists in one study found it made it easier, none found it made it harder. That, that three times first stick success, that was done against cold spray. So I think that's probably... Um, that's probably more because it says more about cold spray not being good than it says about buzzy increasing. The one thing is though that vibration does vasodilate and it also is a sympathetic stimulator, meaning that the whole vasovagal thing, a lot of the patients who have used buzzy for IVs don't faint because instead of getting a parasympathetic poke, they're getting a sympathetic stimulus with the vibration. So the frequency really matters. And this is why I showed that very complicated slide. So in the last few years, it's been proven that the Pacinian corpuscle is the one that does the pain relief. And you have to be very fast. About 200 hertz is what the frequency is. So the device inside has a, a motor. And that motor is where the action of Buzzy happens. Um, because that's where the frequency is delivered. And that does, in, for IV access, about 60 to 90% of the pain, depending on the study. We put a little dot on the plastic outside cover so that you know where the maximum pain relief is gonna be. And you wanna try to put the shot near the dot or put the, eye, put the, the needle as close to that as possible. The other way that ice works, so Buzzy has two different sensations. And so the ice does something called descending inhibitory control. Basically, it's an unpleasant, feeling that causes the brain to register this is unpleasant but not dangerous so let's loop and decrease that sensation where that's coming from because we don't want to hear that information it's not helpful if the ice is too cold you can do a couple things the personal units have a white side that is fuzzy and so it's less cold so you can flip it over if you're in a hospital and you've got one of the ice packs that is clear so that you can clean it in between patients, you can actually just let the patients hold it in their hand. Because this is a feedback loop, it doesn't have to be direct. If you're doing an immunization or an IM or embryo or any kind of injection, then yeah, you wanna use the ice there because you're gonna get a deeper penetration of pain relief. But for an IV, it doesn't matter. They can hold the ice any place or you'll still get 90% as much pain relief without it. All right, so if you're going to use thermomechanical stimulation to block pain, you want to put the device proximal to the site of access, but not directly on it. And then just clean and go. You don't, it's so superficial, you don't wanna wait. Um, you can leave it in place and should leave it in place while you're going because you're gonna get the additional vasodilation from the endogenous nitric oxide release from the vibration. One other thing is if you've got a problem with tegaderm that you're removing, you can feel free to put the buzzy next to the tegaderm while you're taking it off to decrease the pain of that. It doesn't matter what kind of pain it is. So the other part that's complicated is that by putting buzzy between the brain and the pain, you need to know where the dermatomes are. You have to actually be blocking the nerve path so it's easy on the arms, just put it directly above, no problem. But if you're putting it for a pick line, the arms are a little bit different. I mean, this obviously isn't where a pick line goes, it's the other side, but, um, but you can see where sometimes putting it directly above can be hard. And then if you're doing a port access, there have never been any studies directly on port access, so I'm going by what my hemonc nurses tell me. And some of them will put it directly on the port for about 60 seconds and then take it off. 
Others will put it between the brain and the pain on um, by testing. They'll use an edge of a uh, an alcohol swab or just something that's a little pokey and move Buzzy until it's in the place where it blocks the sensation the best. So you can see that the nerve pathways are a little more complicated around where ports usually are. And so trying to block it, I would go just a little bit above. A lot of people ask, is this mental distraction? And it's not. So you need to add something for them to focus on in addition to the Buzzy for pain. So one of the studies looked at patients who had profound cognitive impairments, and that was the one where the effect of the device was the strongest. Uh, sham devices don't do anything. And adding some kind of distraction can get you up to 88% pain relief. Also, adult studies have consistently found better results by about 10% than pediatric. I think this is probably because pediatrics have more fear, but also adults are better at distracting themselves. And so they're kind of already adding an element of distraction to the pain relief. This is a little guy who's the, the son of a friend of a colleague of mine. And he was so into his video game that they gave him a tiny bit of bursed when they took his chest tube out. And he didn't remember or notice that the chest tube had been taken out. So distraction is pretty powerful. Moving on really quickly to um, the final part. So focus can't just be talking about your dog, Timmy. Um, focus, actually, what works best is having a physical task and a visual rote component. What do I mean by that? So on the distraction cards that we made, they are asked questions, and they have to find something and point to it. So there is a sorting process, there is a problem solving process, and there's a physical process. These have been found to be more effective than kaleidoscopes, videos, blowing up balloons, they're actually even more effective than virtual reality, or equivalent to virtual reality. So you can see on this one that adding distraction and the pain relief of a thermal mechanical intervention gives you better results than just pain relief alone or just distraction alone. So let's do two cases and then I will take some questions. So here you got a little guy who is going to have to get a dose of antibiotics IV because he fell into poop and cut his head. So you notice first of all that he's afraid. So you start by telling him that you're gonna explain everything and letting him choose a lot of things. One thing to let him choose is the position of comfort. So now that he's in mom's lap, he's a lot more comfortable and less scared. You give him something to do and you find whether or not there's anything that's worked for him before. Turns out he had Emla once and you've got time. So you go ahead and give him either, um, I'd probably use Elamax for this just because I don't have two hours to wait in the emergency room. Um, and then also letting him play with the buzzy so he can use that and get over the novelty of it. And then for focus, blowing a pinwheel, iPad with a physical, um, it's like anything with building cakes or something where you're moving it is great. And then having a task, something he can look at and he has got a job to do, those are really good ways to decrease fear by increasing focus. So now let's talk about a 28-year-old woman who is very afraid of having blood taken out of her arm. So you ask her the question and discuss what has happened before. It turns out people have been mean to her and have shamed her. So let her know this is gonna be nothing like that. She doesn't need to be NPO, so you can give her some time to drink 16 ounces of a Coke. And then for pain, what's worked for her, for her before is LMAX and a hot pack, so that's easy to do. And then for focus, one thing I like for adults is if you don't have any props around you, you always have some piece of written word in the room. So if they are English speaking or if you can get your idea across in another language, a really good thing is to have them count the number of letters in a sentence that have holes. For example, in the sentence count letters with holes, uh, O is one, E is two, E is three, uh, o is four, and by the, it's, it's hard to concentrate on counting something when you take it out of context. So by the time they've counted the letters and count letters with holes, you're done with the procedure. And then big breaths are good for anyone. 
So if they are not telling you that they want to distract themselves and look away, suggest to them that you'll tell them when to take a big breath and then how to blow it out. So in summary, and thank you so much for dealing with our technical difficulties, um, needle fear is on the rise. You're not imagining it. But it's not because people are wimpy. It's because of the way that we have changed our needle procedures during the booster period. But luckily, vasovagal symptoms can be mitigated. And using an intervention for pain, fear, and focus simultaneously is the best way to change the memory and reset their expectation so that the next person who gets to do their blood is going to have an easier time than you will. Thank you so much, and I am here to answer some questions for people who still have some time. There was a conversation that you and I talked about a little bit this morning from Facebook a few weeks back to where folks were asking about this device specifically for use for phlebotomy. And a, a person came on saying, you can't use this for phlebotomy because it skews the results or it will cause hemolysis. Can oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so in 2013, actually, I think I've got a slide on this. Um, in 2013, this guy in Brazil was funded by a guy who made a transilluminator. So the idea was that you would just, you wouldn't use a tourniquet at all. You just put this thing on top of the vein and blood flows. And so this company was trying to get uh, this to be the standard of care. So the first thing that this guy, um, Limi Olivieri, Limi Olivieri, anyway, so, but this Brazilian scientist, the first thing he did was he tested the transilluminator versus a tourniquet left on for 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, up to five minutes. And he found, and you can actually see it in this translator, the, the trans and tourniquet columns. So he found that if you left the tourniquet on for two minutes, that was when you could change the labs the most. So then, I have no idea why, so then he goes and he tests the transilluminator, which they called the gold standard after one study. They tested the transilluminator versus fuzzy. And we were just starting, and so when I saw, you know, it changes lab results, I freaked out. Well, it turns out um, they set up the study to put fuzzy with the tourniquet, because fuzzy has a tourniquet with it, um, on for two minutes. And as you can see, the change in labs was no different than just a standard tourniquet. So basically all they proved was using a tourniquet for two minutes is different from a free flowing collection. So um, he didn't cite, so the, the journals got in touch with me and asked me to review the paper, not knowing that I had anything to do with fuzzy just because because I publish in this area. And so when I started digging in, that was when I found that this uh, Lemmy Olivieri guy had already published studies about this transluminator with a tourniquet. So, um, so fortunately, I was able to write uh, editorials for each one, but the journals, even though there was scientific misconduct, because he did not disclose that he was funded by the guy who made the transluminator, but um, it sucked at the time. But at this point, I mean, we're, we're used by Quest Diagnostics. They've been using us for seven years. We've got plenty of papers that show that there's no differences. But that when it first came out, uh, Dennis Ernst of Phlebotomy, Phlebotomy Today ran a piece based just on the abstract. And he didn't read the whole paper. He didn't read the editorial. And when I brought this to his attention, he was mortified. So he published a retraction and apologized. And he doesn't let the, the Olivieri guy, um, he won't publish anything the guy likes anymore. So, um, so if I go in for for our, some lab tests, I can bring a buzzy with me and say, I don't want to feel it. Well, I'm not going to say you're not going to feel it. Um, it decreases pain in adults about 80%. So, but yes. That's you pretty can. good number. Okay. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Very good. Yes, you can bring it and people do. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's just, if it was somebody who's been, who's old school, that's been around a long time and, and yes. saw that thing in phlebotomy today, then if they didn't see the retraction two months later, then they may have just made up their minds and, and not know. But we have a lot of, um, this is just a little sample, uh, but we have a lot of patients who have vasovagal syncope who bring it just not for pain, but just to block the syncope. Uh, the CDC did a study for HPV vaccines that found that 
3% of those in the music distraction group fainted and nobody in the buzzy group fainted, but it's so uncommon that it's really hard to do a, a statistically significant um, prospective trial. Well, this is a perfect group for that piece of data because we, it's a, it's a small community and we talk a lot. So I appreciate the clarification. Um, oh, and Lord knows, I will send you, <laughs> I will send you all sorts of papers if you would like to. Uh, I would uh, love that. And I can share it with our group. I would love to do that. Yes, please. Um, I can answer the question that what is the efficacy for thermal vibration use for deeper vessel access, such as um, with USGIV placement or PIC? So two answers. One is that this is in a randomized controlled trial right now at University of Pittsburgh. So we should have an answer. So in terms of success for PIC line, don't know. I know it's being used for PICs, but I don't know how it changes success from normal. Um, from a pain standpoint, buzzy, at this, the thermal mechanical vibration at this point is the most studied for IMs. And so the, the ice and vibration for IM are definitely both required for the maximal pain relief. Um, and it's better than EMWA, LMAX, um, any of the other interventions for IMs. But I will say there actually have not been a whole lot of topical anesthetic studies with vaccines, immunizations, IMs. It's, um, it's surprising. Everybody extrapolates data from vascular access, um, specifically peripheral vascular access, but they they're really are different. Just like PICs are different from a peripheral, uh, there's a lot of different in the amount of pain. So I think we're still staying tuned and fortunately somebody is studying that. Lighter dose though I'm excited about, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna get that. So standardized procedures. Yeah, I actually wrote an article for Clinics of North America in 2013 and it has, um, you know, aside from the fact that JTIP wasn't around then, it has pretty much all of this in it. So I will be happy to share that article, but it's in uh, Pediatric Clinics of North America, 2013, Baxter and uh, procedural. And I've also written a, a bunch of chapters on pain management in the emergency medicine textbook, um, Stratmeyer and something, but I wrote the pain chapters in that. And so it also is the same kind of thing. I think if that's what you mean by standardized procedures, but I, I do really think you've got to personalize it, that the best way to do this is to, to find out what people have done before. So here's the thing about buffered lidocaine. If you're talking about buffered lidocaine before every peripheral IV or midline start. So if they are not that afraid of needles or if you're good at it, University of St. Louis has been using buffered lidocaine for years. So a little 30 gauge with a bleva lidocaine, I think it's great. Um, I think it's it's probably it and pick it and J tips are probably the most intense pain relief you're gonna get. The the issue is just practice. Um, it's not something that's easy for everybody to use. And if somebody has a uh, a fear of needles, then using two needles is a problem. In terms of using it before everyone, if you're really talking about, um, you know, does everybody need to have pain relief in that kind of way? Uh, not everybody, I mean, honestly, I don't care. <laughs> I, um, so, so I would rather just get it over with, I don't need two sticks, I don't need to have that. And um, so I think it really, again, is something that, that I think every patient that doesn't like needles or fears needles deserves pain management. Yeah, the normal, so the question is, what about using normal saline with preservative? You know, the, the normal saline bleb questions, so what they're doing is they're actually using gate control. So by putting in normal saline, you are stretching the Raffini corpuscles. So you're giving a fairly brief stretch that decreases that stretch and pressure of the Merkel discs and the Raffini. That's what's causing the pain relief. Um, those studies, by and large, were done in patients who were not afraid of needles. And I can't emphasize enough that any study that's done in patients who don't fear needles is not applicable to most of your patients these days. Because if you're not afraid of needles, you can concentrate on whether you think something hurts a 4.5 or a 6.2. And um, that's, that's not the state of mind that your patients who are afraid of needles are. Are there dangers of JTIP of inserting a medicine into the body? So JTIP is using a um, carbon dioxide to put lidocaine in, 
and it's just spraying it around. So you're really not putting medicine in in any way differently than if you were doing a bleb of lidocaine with a 30 gauge needle. It's just that the speed at which it goes in can, can break some of the capillaries that gives you the tattooing, which is fine if you have normal clotting mechanisms, but not fine if you don't. So that's where there's an issue. I'm interested whether people have had to stop using JTAP because I must admit, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's so long as you can avoid scaring patients by letting them know, you know, it's going to be a pop goes a weasel. It's going to be a really loud, you know, make a pop sound, let them know it's going to be loud, play a game with it. But I've had several patients come to me from centers who uh, used a lot of J tips, and some of them get traumatized because if they're not properly, you know, medical, you know, procedural, uh, the the coping from procedural reinterpretation. If you don't reinterpret that sound, they think something's gone wrong. So then they freak out. So um, I I will look into more on the if there's been problems with J tip, but I I think it's just that it's six bucks a thing. It's very expensive to do for everyone. Um, there's some good studies with it for neonatal lumbar punctures. Um, so I, but I will, I will. Uh, Developmentally, what is the youngest age that Buzzy can be utilized and still be effective? So it's actually been used for heel sticks um, effectively. So what I would not do is I don't use ice below age two, unless it's a kid who wants to play with the ice and hold it, and then I let them hold it in their hands. But otherwise, there is no lower limit for vibration um, and for efficacy because the nerves work the same in neonates as they do in older patients from vibration. The ice, that's the, that descending inhibitory loop thing, that gets stronger as you get older. So between age two and four, it's kind of touch and go whether it's going to help you or hurt you. And you just have to let the kid choose. And then the older they are, the more the ice contributes. But neonatal heel sticks, using vibration for neonatal heel sticks um, has been found to be effective. One thing that is also important though, all vibration is not created equal. You have to be in this very high frequency. So some of these studies are done with like soothing or CPT vibrations that are much slower. They're not gonna stimulate the pachinian corpuscle. You, you may get other effects, but you're not gonna get the pain blocking effect. What is the mechanism of action on using intradermal Benadryl to substitute when people have a true lidocaine uh, reaction? Sure, and actually, you know, I'm, I'm also, whether they have a lidocaine reaction or there are some people that the sodium channel blocking doesn't work with lidocaine, so they get nothing out of it. Um, so diphenhydramine is like lidocaine in that both of them are um, hydrophilic and lipophobic, meaning that they are, are going to be charged in such a way that they can have some effect on the sodium channels. So that would be my best guess as to why diphenhydramine can work. But in addition, the same thing is like with the saline, you're gonna stretch the Raffini corpuscles. And so you'll get some degree of an A beta pain inhibition from the stretching that happens from putting an infusion in. Um, so okay. It is requesting buffer lidocaine 1% subdermal prior to uh, beta hydropurine for ultrasound guided IV access, a contraindication for inpatients. That is outside my pay grade. And you know what I have found? That um, definitely there's plenty of places I have worked where they use that and they do that. But every hospital makes up its own rules and all JCO requires is that you be consistent with your pain management and procedural sedation practices throughout the hospital. So that is going to be coming from, that is definitely not uh, contraindicated. There are plenty of hospitals that do that, but the, whether it is contraindicated or not is, is a local practice style. That's what your hospital decides to do. And then you have to be consistent throughout all different areas once a policy is made. This is a great one. How can it be used between patients following infection control practices? So um, all you do is take a disinfecting wipe like chlorhexidine, alcohol wipe, and you do the same thing you would do if you were sharing a blood pressure between patients. So here's how it works. And you can put the, you can either hold it or put, um, the XL is the best one because the, the mini is really just for like in vitro fertilization or if somebody is giving themselves injections, this is the size difference. That's a mini. That's an XL, so they're pretty similar. They're about 
but the XL has a slot for a tourniquet and the mini does not. So this is the one, if you're giving yourself, you know, insulin or something, put the shot near the dot, that's where that goes. But um, for hospitals, we recommend getting the healthcare XLs. And then this is a personal wing, you can flip it over, but the hospital ones are all clear. So you can wipe them down with a sandy wipe and different hospitals do differently. Some of them will keep a hundred of the, cleanable ice wings in the freezer in a, like University of Wisconsin uses a pencil case. And then when they're done, they put it in a little basket beside the freezer. And whoever the unlucky person is who draws the last wing has to clean all of them and put them back in. Uh, Children's Healthcare of Philadelphia requires a two minute clean. So they'll clean this with a sandy wipe. I mean, it's, it's kind of like we're all doing with COVID now, right? Pretend, instead of this being a mask, you know, you just, you have to wipe it down and they use a two minute wipe. So they've actually started um, using more of the disposable or single use or single patient. You can use it over and over, but single patient wings so they don't have to clean them. But um, that's really all you need to do because you're not putting it where you're getting access. You're putting it directly above. So, you know, if I'm getting access here, I'm just sticking it on here and then I'm cleaning and going. So all you have to do is clean. This part doesn't even actually touch the body if you're using a wing with it. Yeah, so just, just chlorhexidine wipe, alcohol, alcohol wipe, and just disinfect the same way you would if you were sharing a blood pressure cuff between patients. Is Buzzy used with blood donations? So it is in other countries. In fact, one of uh, the randomized, so all of these 50 studies have been done all over the world by independent investigators, because A, I'm cheap and I don't pay for anything, but I also don't believe in funded studies um, unless it's funded by the NIH. I just think that conflict of interest is too, is too rampant. So I don't want anything to do with studies somebody else is doing. The one thing I'll say is I don't like people repeating studies that have already been done so many times that there is no clinical equipoise. We know Buzzy's better than control. So I, I will actively try to discourage more of those because I don't think that's ethical either. But a study by Sahin et al. in Turkey looked at adult blood donation and they found that it improved donor satisfaction and it decreased time of draw because the blood flowed faster because the vibration triggers a sympathetic response which gives you nitric oxide release so you get some vasodilation so the blood flows faster. I've tried to tell people about it with the Red Cross here, but they're like, well, you know, you need to do a study on that. And um, I'm studying other stuff. I'm studying opioid use now. So I, I have not, and I also, again, I don't think it, I don't, I wouldn't trust a study that I did on blood donation. I just think there's too, too much, uh, too much room for bias. So there is a study on blood donation from Turkey and it's on our bibliography and I'm happy to, I'll, I'll share that with you, uh, Judy, also. Can you address the best way adult patients can have discussions with their provider about access to slash pain medication and or mild relaxing medications during tunneled catheter removal and placement? Mm, well, first of all, wouldn't it be great if we were in Australia and places where they use nitrous oxide easily and well, because nitrous, is such a lovely thing for any kind of, of quick, painful tunneling procedure. Um, that said, uh, what I would do is say, I have a history of bad experiences and I get very anxious and it does impact my, my blood pressure and my ability to tolerate the procedure. Obviously you don't lie, but, um, but um, in the past, other phlebotomists have found that you know, midazolam five milligrams or whatever it is you want um, have been really helpful. Who is the person I would go to to get that before this procedure? And so don't, I, I wouldn't give wiggle room for you can't have it, um, but, I would, but I would advise adults to talk to somebody before the procedure, because obviously if they're coming at you right at that moment, I mean, that's kind of like my, <laughs> I need versed, no you don't. Um, at, you know, because bringing it up right at that minute is not helpful. But, um, but that's how I would approach it. If I, if I needed this beforehand, I would get in touch with the department head or the, the nurse manager and say, hey, I've got a history of vasovagal um, responses, um, you know, even if it's not syncope, but I, 
Um, so what has worked for me before is this, or I have not had something that's worked for me before, but I have been researching this and I know that midazolam five milligrams is something that a lot of people use. Who would I need to talk to to get this? So once you've gotten some, some input from someone and of course keep that person's name. So then if you show up with it and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna use this intranasal midazolam or, you know, this, is, this has been done uh, and Nurse Ratchet said it was okay. Um, that's the best way to help. So uh, Lee is asking about placing a longer IV catheter, such as those that are approximately two or three inches long. Where would you place Buzzy when inserting that? Um, you wanna place Buzzy as close as possible to the site where the needle is gonna go into the skin. And the thing is, you can then, once you've, once you've gotten access, then you can sequentially move Buzzy up a little bit as you need, to, if you're tracking a, a longer catheter up, because again, you're gonna get a little bit, it takes about eight seconds for the vasodilation to kick in. So what's happening is that vibratory frequency stimulates the sympathetic nerves, which release nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. That takes about eight to 10 seconds. So you can kind of slowly march it up, but you want to have the skin is where most of the nerves are, and so you want to have fuzzy as close as possible to that initial spot. Does that answer the question? Okay. Leo is asking, um, he tells his patients veins don't have sensation in them once he's through the skin. They shouldn't feel anything because nerves are only on the skin. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Now, there's a lot, there are a lot fewer, but they do have nerves. In addition to, um, in addition to the vagus nerve, they also do have, um, I mean, like, I, I, if you have, uh, you know, people with dialysis, right? So people who are undergoing dialysis and they've got a button, uh, different, different angles when those buttons are cannulated can hurt in different places. And the skin's not being penetrated at all, it's the veins. So there still are nerves for pain that are on veins. They're, they're also on arteries. I mean, if you think about somebody who's got um, a, an aortic dissection, you know, they, the, the artery starting to rip or pull, that hurts. And so, um, they've got fewer nerves, but they do still have nerves and they do still uh, have the ability to have pain. Did we cover the LMX and EMLA in the neonate population? Um, we did not. LMX, again, is not FDA cleared for, um, needle procedures. So people have been kind of winging it. And EMLA is preterm children. Uh, you don't want to have, you, sorry, EMLA is cleared for 37 weeks gestation and up. There's a lot of different studies that have been used, um, that have been done for circumcision. I like uh, Cincinnati Children's guidelines on that. You know, it's uh, the guideline, guidelines are out there. You pretty much just don't want to use more than the equivalent of five milligrams of lidocaine per kilogram. So topical anesthetics, unless you're using it for a giant waxing event, uh, you're really not going to run into much uh, in the way of toxicity for older children. And then for preterm, it's just that EMLA is 37 weeks and up. Uh, and you still just don't ever do more than a tube per five years of age, and you'll be fine. Because there's not FDA clearance for LMAX, that's another one where individual institutions um, make up their own best practices because they don't, there isn't a guidance elsewhere. Can the vasovagal reaction occur after the procedure is over? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the vasovagal, so um, it, it, like I said before, um, you can have people who, have a very strong vasovagal response that can have that response by watching a procedure and not even being touched. Or even if it's really strong and they're skinny, usually skinny, low blood pressure females, um, they can pass out or get lightheaded just by having someone talk about their root canal. So after the procedure is over, sometimes they've got a whole lot of energy that's keeping their blood pressure up. And so that that drop between you know they're so nervous they go up to 150 over 110 and then they drop down to their normal uh, 90 over 60 
and then they think about the procedure and then all of a sudden they bop down to 70 and then you're having to call somebody. Um, so it's not, it's not common, but certainly it can happen. One thing that, so in addition to that pulling your hands technique, also just physically, if you can get their legs to squat, so if they're standing up, um, just have them squat right where they are, that will, uh, that will shoot the blood from their legs and knees up to their head. Just because the, the compression of the thighs on the knees as you crouch, that doesn't allow for the blood to pool and it shoots it back up. So that's a really quick, if you see somebody about to go down, try to get them to crouch quickly. Awesome tip. Um, for the, those of you sticking in, this is still a one CE talk. We are, we are <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate you being here. Now you're here just for the fun, is what and it is. And the fact that the audio is working, so now I I want to I want to move it while we've got good audio. Seriously. So, uh, so Angela is asking, uh, still back to nerves in vasculature. Um, it, but the nerves are not inside the vasculature. Correct, and I believe the middle layer is innervated. Well, we know that there's nerves inside the vasculature because they can vasoconstrict and vasodilate, and nerves mitigate the muscles. You know, the nerves trigger the muscles to do that. Um, but I have not looked at this for probably fifteen to twenty years. So um, certainly, the vagal the the vagal nerve wraps around the outside. But I, I believe that you're right, Judy. I believe that there is a, an innervated layer inside the endothelium. I believe so. Like you said, that's um, vasoconstriction, and you can have them clamped down like crazy. So I. I and you've got. I mean, it, obviously, it's it's you know it's the a, an endovascular muscle layer that is causing that to happen, but it has to be triggered by innervation. So there has to be a nerve that's taking it to that. But I think that I mean I think that if you think about it, the the best analogy is that that person on dialysis who's getting cannulated because the if the button is already there there's no skin involved there's no skin in the game the only thing that's causing them to have pain is the pain from the the needle um touching the fistula inside and so that's where pain is coming from so you know and we've all seen that happen and so they are you kind of go okay well clearly there are nerves on that are that are on the vasculature too it's just not nearly the uh, the number and the density that are on the underside of the skin with those a delta with the a delta web. Also, you know what? They just found another pain organ um, about oh gosh, maybe nine months ago. I was reading that they they discovered another sharp pain mitigator that specifically excuse me specifically related to needle pain. And I'll have to go find that again. But it was interesting. There's just there's a there's a whole other um, pain organ that was related to to the vasculature. New discoveries happen all the time. All the time. Do you find these being used widely for vaccinations? And when they're not, do we know why? Um, yes, we have sold about two hundred and fifty thousand of them. And when they're not, I think it's because the number of vaccines that nurses have to give have gone up so much and there is a lack of empathy in nursing. And also the place where you really get the bang for your buck is the four-year-olds and over. And I think um, when Buzzy first came out, you know, nurses are overworked. They don't want to have to use uh, something for pain. They don't think pain matters because they were born before 1983. So they think these are wimpy little kids who've got, um, indulgent parents who are lame. And, and there's really, we're starting in some places to realize that the, um, the teenagers who aren't getting vaccinated and the flu clinics are worse when you've got needle clinic parents and fact, or patients. In fact, uh, I was at the American Academy of Pediatrics last year and this nurse came up to me now, we, the, that, that study that had the different um, degrees of fear for different numbers of vaccines, so I published that in 2017. And this pediatrician came up and she said, I want to let you know that I read your study and we have started, we've instituted a policy of no more than two injections per visit for the four to six year boosters. And she said, I just want to let you know, I've done this for two years now and our flu clinics for those kids 
are a breeze. No, none of those kids mind getting one shot now. She said, it's really, it's changed everything. None of them are afraid. They're proud that they're such troopers and they're proud of how they handle it. And she said, it's made a huge difference. So I think that, um, I think that as we get to this concept of needle phobia and anti-vaxxing, and we realize how much of that is due to kids becoming needle phobic because of the way they were vaccinated at age four to six, I think we're gonna start changing. But um, it, it's, it's both a lack of empathy, and you, I, I did a TED talk on it. You can see the, um, it's, I think it's, if you look up Baxter Needles Empathy, you'll, you'll see it but lack of empathy, um, lack of time and burnout and lack of understanding of what the serious medical consequences are down the road. And all of that is stuff that's, that's fairly recent. This is a new phenomenon. So I think that it's inevitable that we will start doing better pain relief, whether it's buzzy or whether I hope we get, I hope we get microneedles. I hope we get sublingual. I hope we get um, something that just doesn't hurt rather than a needle. But until then, um, we've got a number of different barriers to, to overcome. I couldn't agree more. As being a phobic kid with needles, oddly enough, for what I do for a living now, but um, I wish they would have had something like this because I was truly phobic. I can't thank you enough for this webinar. It was fascinating. You're a great speaker, and it was fun. So for everybody that hung in there, thank you. And Dr. Baxter, thank you. This was wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Be safe out there.